Hi everyone and welcome to this additional element of training on your uh, master's dissertation. So in this brief video um, I'll, I'll be giving you some ideas on how to write that chapter one. Okay and that's what we're going to be focusing on. So if you look at the assignment specification document that I've put on Moodle for you all. So you go on to your uh, whether it's OMED 1357 1386 or 1413, your dissertation uh, module. Go on there, go to the very first block that's got a finger saying start here. Go into the start here block and in the resources book you'll find in the table of contents there's something called assignment specifications. Okay and there's one for the, the extended literature review and one for the other types of projects. So whichever one you're doing, click onto that and you'll see literally word by word what you should be doing for each of your chapters. But what I'm going to do in this video is just highlight the materials that you've got for chapter one only. Okay, and that chapter is actually the same right across the dissertations. So um, what the, the information I'm giving you now is good for all of you. Look what it says on the little blurb here that you will work in relation to your uh, research supervisor. It's your responsibility, your responsibility to contact them. OK, they're not going to be chasing you up all the time. It's your responsibility. And my advice would be meet with them early on to discuss your project and to see what great advice they can give you. But also then, as you do your chapters one by one, um, check out with the supervisor. But most of them prefer to have it chapter, uh, um, chapter by chapter at the time. So as soon as you finish chapter one and you feel that you're fairly happy with this, that's the time to send it to them because then they might give you some advice and some tips on how to do your following chapters rather than you do them all and then submit the whole thing as a draft right towards the end. It's much easier to submit chapter one as the draft first. And remember that motif I've used with you in class, um, talking about waves coming up on a beach. So think of the waves coming up on the beach, especially if you want to run away from all of this and go somewhere nice. So think of those waves coming in on the beach. Each time they come in, the water behind them is getting deeper in and deeper. So the intensity of your work is growing, but also each time you do a little bit more, you're just pushing those waves forward. So keep thinking of you're building your work up incrementally. And even when you think of doing your various chapters, it may be that some days you've got a lot of time in which you can get down and really get on with some work. Other days you might think your time is limited. So on those days, maybe just have a look at the assignment specification document that I've done and think, right, David's given us all these little subheadings. Let me just brainstorm some ideas under each one of those. And maybe that's all you'll do one day. Or another day you might have uh, time to write a few sections. Another day you might go in and not have much time. So you can read through it all to make sure it sounds as good as possible. And then keep asking yourself, have you written a sentence that sounds like a point of fact or that you're making a statement? So if you say that um, um, healthcare, in, healthcare simulation in the world has been increasing over the last 15 years, that's a point of fact. Where did you get that from? How do you know that? That's where you need to back check then and make sure you've got references for everything. So as you read your work, if a sentence sounds as though you're making a statement, you've clearly got it from somewhere. So try and find a reference for that. OK, even if it means that you Google that particular sentence and see what references come up. Now, in an ideal world, you would read the whole resource that you find. Um, but I realise we don't live in an ideal world. OK, so it's your responsibility to speak to your supervisor. And especially then when you send in your first full draft, constantly think of them as drafts. They're not final until the day you submit the whole thing. So don't worry if it comes back with lots of uh, um, comments and suggestions and things to change. That's what a draft is for. And that's exactly what we do with our doctoral students as well. 
So you consider it a draft, it comes back from the supervisor, you can look at all their comments, take them on board, especially if they relate to further chapters that you have to be doing, okay? Um, also, it says in here, you might want to talk about um, the background, I'll come on to that in a moment, and the rationale, and that literally means the reason why. Why do you want to do this? Why have you decided that this is important enough to take 10,000 words on? Okay, so you look at some of those things, uh, uh, some of those issues, and this is what we'll cover now in this particular presentation. Also, when it talks about epistemology and ontology and ethical considerations, of course, that could relate differently to all of you. So supposing one of you decides to do a study which happens to be quantitative, so you're looking at numbers. Well, more often than not, the epistemology that underpins quantitative research is going to be called positivism or post-positivism, okay? So if you just check out, is positivism part of quantitative research? You'll find a reference for that, okay? But then say, for example, let, let, let me give you a really good idea here. Supposing you're talking about something like domestic violence and abuse. So you might say, well, look, I want to come at this. I, I'm a health visitor and I want to come at this particular project from the point of view of seeing how prevalent this is. So that's quantitative. So you might be looking at studies that are just talking about the numbers. But then supposing you say, well, no, it's not just the numbers I want to look at. I want to try to understand how people feel about it. Well, when you say that, who do you mean by people? Do you mean the recipient of the violence, which most times happens to be female partners, but not always, because what happens if you have a same-sex partnership, or even sometimes it could be female on male. So you have to think about whose lens, whose eyes do I want to look at this through? Is it through the victims or maybe the perpetrators? What makes a person be violent towards somebody else? So you might say, well, that's what I want to try to explore. So all of that will influence what you consider about epistemology. So say, for example, if you think, well, I want to look at domestic violence and abuse where women are the recipients or the victims of this and males are the perpetrators. In that case, epistemology that you could look at would be feminism. So feminism is a lens. It's a way to look at things. So you would use a feminist epistemology to try to understand this. But also you might say, well, but I want to know what makes a, a man do this to a woman. In which case, the epistemology you use then could be masculinity studies. But also a lot of work has been done about um, queering sexual violence. And that's the name of a really good book by, um, edited by somebody called Jennifer Patterson, Queering Sexual Violence. And that takes a very different approach, especially a queer theoretical approach. So that's what I mean here by the epistemology um, and, the on, and the ontology. So the epistemology is the lens you're using, the way you're looking at this. And the ontology is actually the, the position of being. So say, for example, if you are looking at domestic violence and abuse, what is it like to be a victim? What does victim mean? What is victimology? And then especially in that book on queering sexual violence, one of the authors there talks about she was the victim of, of, of violence as a child and she was a victim, but she decided that that would not define her through her life. So she became a survivor. And look how many organizations call themselves survivors organizations. But she said she went one step further and she became a thriver. And that's what's defining the way in which she now goes out to help other people around her country because she has grown through those experiences in those particular ways. So if you say, oh, this particular person is a victim of something or other, what does it mean to be a victim? That's ontology. If somebody else defines themselves as a, uh, uh, a survivor, that's an ontology. And if somebody calls themselves a thriver, that's another ontology. So that's how you can weave all of this in. Now, if you're doing a, a positivist or post-positivist study, so if you're looking at numbers, 
if that's what you're doing, then you might only be paying lip service to this, saying, look, quantitative research is usually post-positivist, and that means, and then say something about it, okay? Um, whereas somebody else, if they were doing, the, like the example I just gave you on domestic violence, then the themes of epistemology and ontology might run right throughout the whole dissertation. So everyone's dissertation is different, okay? And don't go comparing yourselves against others. But here we go, let's have a look now what's happening in these chapters. So, um, look, a little picture of forget-me-nots, so please don't forget this, okay? Chapter 1, Some of the Essentials. This is what it says in that, uh, that, that specification document that's in the Start Here block, okay? So your chapter 1 is your introduction. So you introduce the topic in general. So what is it you're talking about? So supposing it was domestic violence and abuse, and you're talking about it, especially from the point of view of a heterosexual couple, where it's the woman who is the victim and the man who's the perpetrator. So you give a background to that. And remember what I've just said, if you start using sentences that sound like statements. So if you say, well, in the UK, more women than men are the victims of domestic violence and abuse. That sounds like a statement of fact. Where did I get that from? Okay, so find a reference for that and make sure you put the reference in. But then uh, give some background to it. So you may be explaining what your professional role is and therefore why this topic is important to you. And then show how you're going to narrow down this big, broad um, introduction, narrow it down to the manageable project that you want to look at. So you might say, well, look, this is a really big topic I'm talking about, but I'm going to focus in on this. Now, remember what I've told you in other places on how to uh, mind map for a dissertation you might have already drawn all of this out as a mind map diagram and you could put it in as an appendix. So in your introductory chapter you might say, look this is such a broad topic, have a look at appendix one, but for the sake of this dissertation I'm narrowing it down just to focus on and say what you're focusing down on. Okay? The rationale again is why. So you might say, well I'm working in a new field of practice, I've never come across uh, a particular issue before, so I'm doing this to find out more about it and to inform my colleagues. There's a good level sevenness, you're disseminating this already. Um, so you must show how it's relevant. You can't just choose the theme, anything off the top of your head. It needs to be relevant to whatever your job is, your field of practice. Okay. Um, and in, in chapter one, try to think of it um, as a, a research topic, and then you may be coming out with a research question or a hypothesis. Now, for a dissertation like this, probably one main question is fine, even if you have to ask a few little subsidiary questions. But put, do them in such a way that by answering the little subsidiary questions, they all contribute to answering the main overall question. So you don't want to come out with a long list of questions. That's more like for a doctoral study. So I would suggest probably one main research question, even if you have a few um, subsidiary ones. If you're also going to put in um, aims and objectives, your intended learning outcomes, think of it like this. An aim is what you intend to do. So in doing this study, I aim to... What is it you're going to do? You know, do you want to explore um, uh, how beneficial simulated practice is in a particular field of practice? So it's your aim. Whereas the objectives are the achievable outcomes that you're going to do by doing the study. So supposing in your, uh, um, uh, in your study, if you say that you're doing um, um, a survey of patients or colleagues. So if you're doing that type of thing, so one of the outcomes will be to complete a particular survey in uh, as part of this project. Okay, the next one then, um, think about writing it up. And again, look at that, that, that document I've given you. And in there, it talks about different headings that you can use. And I even give you a really good example of how the dissertation should look as a final product. Okay, so when we're talking about level headings, one, two, and three, for example. So you've got your main chapter one 
introduction that's a level one heading then down the side you may have introduction that's a level two heading but sometimes when you use a level two heading you might want a few subcategories underneath and that's when you use a level three heading check out the document it's all in there for you okay so i've talked about the introduction and the background um why the specific focus that you're taking and how you come up with the questions but also as you're coming towards the end of the chapter then so you've given your main introduction you've said why you're narrowing it down and how you're coming out with a specific question or your hypothesis your informed guess about a particular thing you've done all of that and now you're coming right to the end of the chapter so briefly just a few sentences maybe um, tell the reader what they can expect in the rest of it so you might say well in this chapter one i've introduced the topic uh, um, and shown how i'm narrowing it down chapter two is going to be and say what your chapter two is going to be then tell them what's coming in chapter three four and five and traditionally this is five chapters okay so you can do that but then a really good technique is for each chapter you do give them maybe a paragraph of summary so if somebody said to you look i haven't got time to read all of the work what have you done in this chapter you could read them the summary and it encapsulates it beautifully in fact that's like a little abstract of the whole chapter and when it comes to you writing up your abstract a good tip is that you might go through each chapter read your summaries and conclusions and maybe just take one little sentence or so out of each one because you've encapsulated it already so just take that out and that's how you build up your abstract okay and then conclude the chapter but as you conclude it um, think about how you can dovetail that to the next chapter whatever's coming next and you also need to make sure that you're covering in all of this the significance so why is it important even um, say for example if you're choosing a topic on covid now lots of people have been writing on covid because it's such a brand new phenomenon but why is it so specific to you? So you might say, well, look, I'm um, advanced clinical practitioner working in an A&E department and we're seeing more and more people coming in with COVID infections and yet far less media attention to this. And you want to see the significance of this and the impact on your colleagues. So that would be a wonderful thing to do. So what's the significance of it and tell us why it's important don't forget to mention ethics now if you're doing one of the projects such as the audit or service evaluation um, or workplace change project 100% of you need ethical approval for this and I'll, I'll address that um, in another video if you're doing the literature review then you might state in chapter one that you do not need ethical approval for a literature review however the topic that you're considering might have lots of ethical issues in there so you might flag this up and say that you'll be looking out in the studies that you you explore to see how they address ethical issues and ethics then might become a whole big section in one of your other chapters but you only need to refer to it briefly here okay um, don't forget to cite your sources so uh, and again that, that may be on a day when you think I haven't got much creativity going on up here uh, but I've just got half an hour what can I do in half an hour with my dissertation it might be case read through and make sure you've put all your references in remember plagiarism is academic theft and that means using other people's words or ideas or images without citing the source okay so if you use direct words from someone they should be in inverted commas and you need to put the reference in with the page number but even if you read a book or an article um, and you're not using direct quotes from the individuals so you're summarizing it all in your own words you still need to say where you've got those ideas from otherwise you're just stealing somebody else's ideas and pretending you've thought of this so make sure that you cite your sources uh, with each chapter please try to get into the habit of giving a little paragraph of introduction to each chapter so supposing it's chapter three um, 
Uh, maybe that's your methods chapter, depending on which type of project you're doing. So you might say, well, in this chapter, I will outline my epistemologies, methodologies and methods for exploring the topic of, and then tell us again what the topic is. OK, um, so that's at the top of each chapter. And then at the bottom of each chapter, maybe a little paragraph of summary, as I've just said, and a paragraph of conclusion with then a little sentence or so pushing the, the reader into the next chapter, telling them how this chapter is leading into the next one. And that's topping and tailing each of your chapters. For chapter one, the suggested word count is only a thousand words. Now, by the time you write and say, um, like, uh, uh, um, when you introduce the other chapters and you write a summary and a conclusion, that's going to be a few hundred words already. So the big bit at the front, introducing the wider topic and then narrowing it down, there's not that many hundreds of words to do. A thousand words, this is going to be easy for all of you. And that's another thing. If you are feeling overwhelmed, thinking, oh, I've got 10,000 words to do, think of it manageably. Look, I've got a thousand words to do this week. There's your 1,000 words. Do that and get it off to your supervisor, and then you can move on to your next chapter. Um, and that's it. So here's wishing you all well. I hope you really enjoy doing this uh, uh, particular chapter, and then look forward to seeing what your supervisors say. Okay, good luck and uh, best wishes with it all.